How do cryptocurrencies work when quantum computers are around? Hey and welcome to today's episode. My name is Julian and this is part 16 of Crash Course Cryptography. On my channel, I want to make you crypto fit. And that means for you to understand blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and decentralization from a high level, but also from the low level, from the details. And this is what this crash course is all about. It's about cryptography and explaining the nitty gritty about all those things called cryptocurrencies. And there's a reason why it's called cryptocurrencies. And today we want to talk about post-quantum cryptography. So we're going to talk about some very fancy things like Lattice, Bliss, XMSS, Rainbow, and so on. And so let's dive right into this and kind of think about what these things actually mean and why we might need them in the future. So we talked about cryptanalysis already in the past cryptography episodes. And we talked about how a fast enough computer could execute a brute force attack if the key space was not large enough. But what happens if we can't make those keys larger and larger and larger? So basically what happens if a computer gets so fast that we cannot create large enough keys because the computer program is too efficient? And we actually have an algorithm, it's called Shor's algorithm. We discussed this already in later episodes, but this basically works by being able to factor large numbers. This algorithm is not really effective on, or efficient on classical computers, but it could be possible on something else. Now, if it were efficient, this would be quite detrimental because if we think about this, RSA would be completely dead because N could be factored into P and Q and now the period phi would be easily calculatable. Now here, to give you an example, 4,096 qubits would be needed to factor a 2,048 modulus. A 2,048 modulus is literally impossible to factor at the moment. Now, Google right now is with working with around 47 qubits. So we're not quite there yet, but remember, this is exponential growth. So we might not know how long this would take. Um, if we look at Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve, this is actually quite faster. Um, it would only take 2,500 qubits. And so what is actually the problem if this would happen, especially with the curves? Well, the problem is that when we make a transaction, we basically reveal a signature. And the signature with normal computers would not be able to be back calculated to the private key. But with Shor's algorithm, it would be because it is efficient to do so. So the solution obviously is just not to reuse the same private key. But this is not a good solution. There must be a better solution. In order to kind of discuss this, Let's think about how this actually works. How do quantum computers actually work? And I'm pretty sure for most of you, this is a bit of a rehearsal, but I just want to kind of go into this. So if we think of Shor's algorithm, then in, on classical computers, Shor's algorithm tries one solution to the problems, in this case, solving the maze at one time. So first it runs in here, tries everything through, doesn't work, then it tries the other one, and so on, until it finds a solution. A quantum computer with qubits can do all those steps in parallel. So it can go in and it can spread at the same time. So you have an exponential growth versus a linear growth on these classical computers. How this works is with qubits. And qubits do not only exist in a state of zero and one, so they are not binary, they are actually in superpositions. And this, from a mathematical perspective, is very, very interesting. If we have, in this case, let's say 10 bits on a classical computer, this allows us to store Two, uh, 2 to the power of 10, so 1,024 different possibilities. On a quantum computer with qubits that are in a superposition, it's actually 2 to the power of 2 to the power to n. So in this case, 10 qubits would be able to store 2 to the power of 1,024 possibilities. So that's an insane difference if you think about this. And this is where a lot of these possibilities and a lot of this power of quantum computers come from. And then suddenly, Shor's algorithm becomes very efficient and classical cryptography kind of dies down. So what we actually need is, we need post-quantum cryptography. There's one problem, however, we can't prove right now that there are quantum-resistant problems, and there is actually, uh, the, same, the other side 
it's not possible to prove that there are no quantum resistant problems because we don't have strong enough computers yet. So a lot of it right now is theory, but we don't really know about these things yet. So let's look at seven algorithms that would actually be probably quantum proof. So the first one is hashing, SHA-256 or SHA-2 and SHA-3 with at least 256 bit length. That's quantum proof, you cannot back calculate that. Then the advanced encryption uh, standard, same thing, it's symmetric, so it's quantum proof, only the asymmetric ones have a problem. So let's talk about some of the asymmetric schemes. And here we have the extended Merkle signature schemes or XMSS. And basically what it does, it uses a new type of hash-based signature trees called an extended Merkle signature scheme or XMSS. What this thing basically does is, it allows the same public key with different private keys. So in this case, you can reuse the same address because you're constantly changing the private key in the background. And there's actually a crypto, uh, cryptocurrency project that is trying to integrate that. Because at the end, as long as you constantly new, use a new private key, it's impossible to uh, back calculate and then kind of hack this thing. Would be quite interesting and to see how this works. Well, then we have something called Lambert signatures that's based on hash-based uh, cryptography. Basically how this works is you have these one-bit signature constructions to sign multiple bits. So you kind of mix this asymmetric cryptography with hashing and thereby you make it very, very difficult to back calculate. One very interesting one is called lattice-based cryptography that's obviously also asymmetric and it's called a vector cryptography. What you're trying to do in lattice or in the lattice is to find the smallest vector from one point to the other point and you don't only do this here in two or three dimensions, you're actually trying to do this in thousands of dimensions. So it's a very, very, very difficult um, problem to solve. NTRU um, is actually an example of this. The first version of this was broken, however, but they followed up with one that seems to be working. Quite some interesting stuff from them um, online. Then we have the Bliss Signature Scheme. Interesting, it's from an ex-Googler, comes from machine learning. And what's interesting there is it goes a different route. So you don't have to find a solution, but you have to find the problem. Um, the function has a lot of problems and you need to find those. And it's a very, very, very hard um, problem to find the problem. And then obviously we have many, many other applications actually right now at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Rainbow and so on, very, very fancy, fancy terms. Um, blow. So let's see how all these uh, things are actually kind of working out and what's going to be happening there. Now, if we look at those, now what does this actually mean for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Well, SHA as a hashing algorithm is not vulnerable to quantum computers. Elliptic curves is. But at the moment, it still seems that the 256-bit version is secure until 2030. So we have around 10 years. So this should be quite easy. Now there is a solution obviously, and the solution is do not reuse a private key. Um, yes, you can bulk calculate the private key from the signature, but if there's no money on it, it's pointless. And obviously, Bitcoins at rest are not vulnerable at all. What's vulnerable is if you send a, a certain amount from your address without cleaning it and resending it to a new one. Now, this is not a really good solution, though. We want to have a really, really, really solid solution. And so what are post-quantum crypto cryptocurrencies instead of those classical cryptocurrencies, if you want to call it? Well, the good news is, as mentioned before, there are projects who are working on this stuff already. But what is the major problem? The major problem is signature size. The signatures of those post-quantum crypto uh, cryptography schemes is humongous, and it's actually 100 to 1,000 times larger Think about what this means for a blockchain if suddenly it's not gigabytes anymore, but terabytes. So just as an example, and you notice from the episode where we talked about um, uh, signatures and transactions, it's around 65 bytes for a regular signature in a loop the curves. Well, it's in the kilobyte schemes when we talk about post quantum. This is obviously a, a, a bigger problem. Now, there's a couple of things what we can do. Schnorr signatures, something we're going to be discussing in the later episodes, actually allows to have a smaller, uh, they, they store it smaller, so we could have a larger key size and still have the same kind of size. Schnorr signatures per se are not quantum resistant. Some people talk about it, but it's not. It's just you can scale them a bit better. One thing that would truly be quantum resistant would be those Lambert signatures that we discussed before. The good thing about Schnorr and Lambert would be that we could soft fork that, so it wouldn't be an, an entire hard fork. So that's actually um, quite uh, good to hear. 
Now, there is one big caveat for those, or not one big kind of counter argument to all those screamers that say, oh, once we have uh, quantum, quantum computers, all cryptocurrencies die. Well, guess what? Everything that's based on crypt uh, cryptography would die that's not based on post-quantum crypto cryptography. And that means pretty much everything on the internet. So in the next 10 years, I think the entire ecosystem has to kind of solve and decide a lot of those things. And that is why there is so many algorithms here right now at the NIST. And let's see what's going to at the end work out and which of those algorithms is going to be actually the one where most of the focus goes towards. Because at the end, there has to be some kind of standard. And that's what's going to be very interesting here. So the gist of it to take away is, yes, current cryptocurrencies would have a problem if you don't just clean out the address, but you keep reusing the key. Coins that still are not vulnerable, very important. This would be an immediate solution. There are solutions for cryptocurrencies. There's actually currencies that are working on this stuff already. Let's see how this all works out. And this is quite, quite interesting and quite positive. And the third thing, don't worry, everyone has the same problem. We need to solve this all as a community together. So don't let anyone out there scare you that this is a problem of cryptocurrencies. This is something that online banking has as well. So yeah, let's kind of take this with a grain of salt whenever you have these screamers out there. With this, I hope you get a lot of value out of this. I hope this makes it clear. Um, if you like this stuff, please let me know in the comments. Give me a thumbs up. If anything's unclear, let me ask, uh, ask a question, please, down below. And obviously, I'll be looking forward to seeing you at episode 17, where we're going to dive into some cryptographic principles in order to increase privacy with cryptocurrencies. Quite some interesting stuff. Hope I see you. Yours truly, Julian.